Hello, everyone. This is Enid Choi, arts editor of the Self China Morning Post. It's my pleasure to host today's webinar, Collecting NFT Art from Andy Warhol to Damien Hurst. And we've got an exceptional panel of speakers joining us today. Um, let me just very quickly introduce them, and then they will also tell you a little bit about themselves in their own words. We have Ron Rivlin joining us from California. Ron is a collector and also founder of Revolver Gallery in West Hollywood, which specializes in Andy Warhol. Charles Dorsey is the Asia Pacific Managing Director of Consensus. He lives here in Hong Kong. Max Moore, um, head of contemporary art at Sotheby's, is also Sotheby's in-house NFT expert. He moved here from New York just two months ago. And Frank Smith, also here with us in Hong Kong, is a seasoned NFT art collector. Uh, gentlemen, before we kick off the uh, actual discussion, um, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, about yourselves? Um, Ron, perhaps you can start first. Uh, sure, okay. Well, I've, uh, I've been in the art business since uh, 1995, but in the, the music side, um, I was actually um, a concert promoter in college with uh, your co-founder, James Neary. We had competing companies in college. Um, and I specialized in electronic music and, and hip hop. Uh, and then I went on to start a talent agency in 1998 called Coast to Coast Entertainment, uh, which represented... Um, I started with like Run DMC and DJ Jazzy Jeff and some of the old school rappers and involved to represent some of the major um, hip hop and electronic artists, uh, international artists. Um, the company still exists. Uh, I have a small roster still, but I have one foot in that business. And, uh, and then I got into hospitality. I owned uh, nightclubs and restaurants in, in Hollywood here in L.A., uh, didn't really enjoy that too much. And that's when I uh, just started collecting Andy Warhol art for my house, which quickly turned into an obsession. And uh, I started Coast to, or a Revolver Gallery about 10 years ago. Um, and since we've uh, owned well over a thousand, um, our current inventory sits at about 300. And, uh, you know, it's a, a, a mixture of, uh, of, of prints and paintings, um, more on the print side as they're more transactional. Uh, and I guess in the fall, I reached out to uh, Mad Dog Jones about doing an, an album cover for a, a band that I manage. Um, knew nothing about NFTs. It was just a total coincidence. And, um, he turned out to be a big fan of, of the, the artists that, that I was, um, or that I am managing. And he told me about NFTs and we, you know, got in this, uh, this great conversation about, about, you know, the concept of NFTs and how do you, uh, appreciate it and, you know, in what, um, uh, capacity and, uh, you know, I kind of challenged him on, on, uh, on, on the concept of it, not, you know, uh, in a very friendly way, just trying to understand how it all worked. Um, and that re relationship uh, evolved into um, me quarterbacking his, um, um, his, his campaign that he did or his uh, NFT called Replicator, which uh, we brought to Philip's auction house and uh, and it was uh, it was a successful and exciting uh, adventure, and uh, that kind of led me into the NFT world. Um, and since then, I've I've worked on a couple other campaigns, just more as a mm. hobby and exciting thing to do. And uh, and I uh, I own a couple too. And um, you tell us tell us more about that later on. Uh, Shell, would you like sure. to tell us a bit more about yourself? Sure, thank you so much, Anil. Uh, and maybe I'll start with a very nice to meet you uh, all today. Uh, so my name is Charles. I uh, lead consensus here in APAC. 
Uh, and uh, we, uh, we are a blockchain engineering company, a six years old company focusing on the Ethereum world. And as you know, about 90% today of the NFTs are, are sitting on this global, uh, global blockchain with smart contract capabilities. Um, before joining Consensus to start the Hong Kong office, I was with the Hong Kong government uh, as head of fintech. Uh, so I've been helping together with, with many other departments of the Hong Kong government to kind of shape uh, the fintech ecosystem here and making sure it's, uh, it's attractive and, and also, uh, uh, I would say, uh, nurturing uh, the local talents and also um, uh, helping Hong Kong to be a, a launchpad for many of these fintech companies in, uh, in Asia. Uh, in this context, we've been helping a, a lot of uh, blockchain companies, and eventually I joined Consensus to start uh, the Hong Kong office and now lead um, uh, the, the APAC uh, customer-facing activities. Uh, I've been in the world of blockchain for quite some time. Uh, I started with um, decentralized systems around file sharing. Uh, later on, I was, uh, uh, I was exposed to, to, to Bitcoin, and it was some kind of... Uh, Easy, uh, easy work for me, uh, understanding how computers can, can build themselves in a, in a, in a, in a distributed manner. Uh, and the concept of, of peer-to-peer -peer money was, uh, was, uh, was very, uh, very much a, a natural progression of this kind of file sharing first. Later on, I started more exploring the smart contract uh, world with, uh, with the birth of Ethereum uh, back in 2015. And, and today at Consensus, uh, we are uh, a large company of more than 500 people globally. Uh, and we are working on all the stack of this uh, global infrastructure that, that is Ethereum, from the protocol layer to the application layer. Uh, if you are in the world of NFT, you may be familiar with uh, MetaMask. Uh, so MetaMask is a product from Consensus, which has been celebrating uh, more than 10 million users uh, last month. And what is very interesting in terms of, of data point to, gi to give uh, and share with the audience uh, how much this space is growing. Um, last year in August, MetaMask was about 1 million users. And one year later, we went 10x uh, to 10 million users. And, and the growth of the platform is, uh, is, just, uh, is just amazing. So it shows really the, the natural uh, appetite for, for, for the users, for this new, new type of digital assets. Uh, should they be uh, crypto or, uh, or NFTs? And uh, I own a few NFTs, but they, they are not related to arts. Uh, they are NFTs which represent my identity uh, into some, mm. uh, some networks. Uh, we've been helping some uh, financial institutions to use NFTs uh, for carbon credit uh, trading. Uh, and we've been deploying uh, NFTs at Consensus uh, over the past years in, in many different uh, iterations. It was not always related to purely uh, graphical art. Uh, we've been involved uh, in supporting um, Euler Beats, uh, which is an NFT platform dedicated to music, uh, helping, the, um, uh, helping the authors and, uh, and the magicians to create and distribute uh, and get a revenue stream uh, during, uh, during the life and, uh, of, their, uh, of their music on, on different platforms. Um, and uh, that, that's the way we, we approach the space in a, in a very much, uh, with, I would say, engineers lenses, uh, looking at non-fungible token, uh, but uh, helping and supporting many different entrepreneurs and, uh, and creators uh, and innovators uh, in using these different type of NFTs, should it be for a, a graphic representation in arts, uh, a musical representation, or, or some other application such as supply chain or, uh, or finance. And of course, Consensus has worked with Damien Hurst um, on Absolutely. his recent launch of his NFT project. Um, uh, Charles, there's a question already about the t-shirt that you're wearing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a MetaMask t-shirt and where can people get one? <laughs> Absolutely. There is, a, there is actually a swag shop on metamask.io. So mm -hmm. just go there. You can get the hoodies. You can get the tea tank. You can get the t-shirt. Uh, mm -hmm. Just go there. Uh, we got some because at Consensus, we celebrated as a, as a, as a company, as a 10 million milestone. But uh, yes, uh, please go online and get, uh, get your own version. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, Max, would you like to go next? Great. Hi, everyone. Um, Enid, thanks for, for hosting. It's a pleasure to meet everyone here on the stage. Uh, I have a feeling I'm going to be learning a lot from this discussion, so that's great. Um, my name's Max Moore. I started with Sunbees 
about six years ago uh, as an intern. Um, I quickly rose kind of through the ranks and was running the Contemporary Art Day Sale um, by uh, when I turned 25 because I had a great understanding of the market and what was valuable and commercial, but also, you know, intellectually stimulating. And I had a really good sense of deciding what pieces would come into the auction and at what price. Um, by fast forward, I guess, three years, um, I've just moved to Hong Kong to run our contemporary art department here for Sotheby's Asia. Um, but as of during COVID, I kind of stumbled upon NFTs as I was looking for different ways to grow our audience and target, you know, pred predominantly a younger demographic of, of engaged users that were not really interacting or engaging with Sotheby's on a day-to-day -day basis, but could really attract, you know, could really have an appetite for, for collectibles and, and purchasing fine art. And um, at first I was honestly very skeptical about NFTs. I came from a very physical, I would say almost traditional background where that interaction, that first interaction with a painting or a sculpture, that, that feeling that you get standing in front of a work um, was, was integral to, to that relationship. And I felt that if an artwork was presented digitally on the same on the same interface that we operate, you know, every day of our lives through social media or, you know, through the computer, through your phone. These are very known spaces for us to interact very differently from, from you know, collecting traditional fine art. And I, and I felt like there was going to be a barrier uh, for a lot of people to start, you know, wrapping their head around collecting something. Um, but, you know, I was proven wrong very quickly. And and I think the inspiration came with several conversations with the artist PAC, um, which was the first Sotheby's sale that I hosted. It was, it, was in, it was really interesting to see how the artist was really approaching the, the concepts of their work and the, you know, the sentiment of their work the same way that a traditional physical artist would. And, and once you, once you, get past that barrier, that mental barrier of, of describing an artwork in its physical form or digital form, you know, it opens up a, a wide, a big doorway to really explore. Um, we've had digital art in the contemporary art context since the 70s with Nam Jun Pike and Bruce Nauman. These are the forefathers, these are the, the predecessors, if you will. But with the combination of the blockchain technologies and the use of NFTs um, and just our general um, appreciation of the digital medium kind of in our everyday lives. I think it was, it's a perfect time to really be, to be capturing this, this identity of our generation of our society through the art mm. form. Cause I always think that a successful yeah. artist is speaking to his or her generation, you know, creating works, timely works that represent um, and will be a memento, in, you know, in future histories. Mm -hmm. So I think it's only natural that the artists are now using a digital medium to express themselves in a world that's ever moving more towards a digital, uh, you know, digital interface. If you will. So uh, the PAC sale was a great success. There was some great uh, lessons to be learned from that sale as well. Um, and yeah, we, we can realize um, that at Sotheby's. We can um, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we I definitely, definitely want to yeah, yeah, hear that. more about um, how the auction world sees its role in uh, what is supposed absolutely. to be a decentralized um, uh, market. Um, Frank. Absolutely. Um, last but not least, Frank, can you tell us a little bit about how you went from. I'm uh, collecting traditional art to, to lots and yeah. lots of NFTs. Thank you so much, Init, and, uh, and hi to all. Uh, thanks for this, this forum. Uh, yes, it has been a journey. So um, I lived a long time in, in, in Indonesia, where I, um, I, I, come, I worked at a company in the fashion industry, where we worked with major brands uh, uh, from around the world on design, uh, development, and production. 
uh, while living there, I, I collected a an, an, an nice um, uh, yeah, range of, of Indonesian um, paintings uh, from well-known uh, Indonesian artists. Uh, moving to Hong Kong, uh, obviously, I, I, had, I had to sell it. Wall space in Hong Kong is smaller than in Indonesia, smaller apartments. And, um, and then um, uh, because of COVID, where retail and, and the whole fashion industry was very much down, uh, quarantine time, uh, you know, homebound. Um, I started following in an early stage through Clubhouse. Um, and actually, I witnessed the, the, the start of the whole NFT, uh, you, you know, development and, and, and birth, actually, you can say. I, um, um, you, you know, it was quite an amazing time. And I'm talking here about end February and beginning of March, when uh, all the artists together gathered on, on Clubhouse. Uh, and it, it was an amazing experience. Uh, digital artists are a different breed than the traditional artists. Um, and suddenly to be connected uh, through Clubhouse with artists from all over the world, from Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Rio de Janeiro, Somerset, UK, uh, it, it, it was an amazing uh, experience for me. I sat maybe 12, 14 hours a day on Clubhouse, uh, gathered my own list of collectors and started buying. So from, wow. uh, let's say, from around uh, mid-March uh, onwards, uh, I started building up my, my collection. Why, and lastly, also why I really believe this, you know, we are just uh, seeing uh, something spectacular developing. And I, I compare it with maybe the start of the internet, uh, you know, at that time. Um, because I, you know, our son, he is nearly 16 years old and he lives off a screen. His life is the phone. You know, they're doing the games, it's all screen time. And I really believe that the younger generation, they don't only want aesthetic piece on their walls, they want to have interactive mediums. And I believe that uh, also the digital art will be part of it. The screen will share the games, music, the YouTubes, the films, but also their art forms. And um, so that's why I'm a very firm believer. And being in contact with all the artists has been an amazing experience. So. That's my, uh, my introduction. Excellent. Um, now, um, Charles, I'd like to turn back to you actually, because you have um, worked in FinTech and the blockchain world for, for many years. Um, and you have witnessed how the NFT world had evolved since you know, the days of CryptoPunks. Um, would you say that it's, do you, would you disagree with uh, a generally shared sentiment that NFT art, most of them are still very crude. Um, you know, the profile pic kind of artwork it still dominates. Do, do you agree or disagree with that comment? I think I, I, I'm more of an engineer or tech, tech kind of person. So I will let the market decide what is really, mm -hmm. uh, what is really uh, meaningful and, and, and valuable. Uh, I guess with this massive blossom we see in NFT, uh, it's fair to it's fair to to think uh, that there, there is some uh, very high quality and, and average quality as well, and uh, and the market will do will do its work uh, on this. But I think it's opening the door to a lot of uh, a lot of uh, creativity to be moving to uh, to digital and to be meaningful in a digi in dig digital format. So for us, what we are very excited at Consensus is to look at how graphics uh, can be uh, can have a new life and a, a valuable life in a, on blockchain systems, but also how music, uh, how the physical art is being redefined. Uh, we see the example with uh, the Damien Hurst um, NFT, uh, NFT event where uh, essentially, the collectioners can choose between the physical piece of art or the NFT, and they have to take to, to make this decision. Uh, we are working very closely with uh, some mobile gaming companies, uh, which are looking at um, at creating um, essentially digital assets within video games, which can be moving from one game to another. So, uh, I guess the booming in uh, in NFT and art today is uh, is uh, the surface of the iceberg, and there is a, a lot of uh, NFT applications which are being built right now. Uh, so mm -hmm. all the media and the attention is now on the graphical aspect of the of the technology, but it's going to help us to pull uh, much more much more applications. And, and possibly mm -hmm. we will see a similar cycle that we've seen some years ago uh, in the ICO boom, 
where essentially the ICO has been a, a blooming period of, of, uh, of uh, fun, a new funding mechanism being born out of blockchain systems. And some of these projects made it over the year, some others disappear, uh, but eventually it stayed uh, and became um, an extra brick to build on top of it uh, for, for the, next, uh, the next wave of innovators uh, and entrepreneurs. So even though everyone will not relate to every single NFT out on, uh, of the market, I think it's just critical for all of us to, to pay attention, to get involved, to get a little bit of skin in the game uh, so mm -hmm. you can start to build your own opinion as the same way uh, you and it might like a, a piece of art and uh, I'm not going to be passionate about it, but I might be passionate about another piece of art which, which you will not resonate with. Uh, we just have to stay open and, uh, and just uh, accelerate everyone's learning into this new, this new way of, of, of uh, creating arts and distributing arts as well. So this, I mean, you, you, you're saying that this space, the NFT space has already become far more diversified. Um, and I also find it quite, quite, um, uh, quite bewildering that we've also seen a diversification in the kinds of platforms. I mean, you mentioned in your introduction that Ethereum still dominates. Um, uh, um, uh, in, in transactions, but you know we're seeing new platforms, new tokens launch practically every day. Um, uh, how how do you think uh, this is going to develop going into the future? Will will, the, will there be consolidation? And also, of course, the uh, a, a question that's very much on on my mind certainly because um, SEMP is preparing for a charity auction of NFTs is um, the, the environmental um, side of things. Um, and um, will, will, will Ethereum and all um, uh, other platforms switch to a, a, a proof of stake or equivalent greener models um, by first, the first half of next year? Let me touch on, uh, on the competitions between what we call the layer one, the blockchains for, for NFTs. Uh, what users are facing from time to time on Ethereum is essentially congestion. It's like a traffic jam. The demand is way too much and growing too fast uh, for the infrastructure. It was exactly the same back in the 90s when you were using internet with your AOL uh, subscriptions or anything like this. So we have, uh, we have essentially a super fast growth uh, of, of users and a technology which is building and, and trying to accommodate this, uh, this, this massive demand uh, step by step. So it's also a proof and a signal that there is a very strong product market fit like the platform brings what the user wants. And so therefore there is many users coming on the platform. It's a little bit similar to people queuing in front of a restaurant. You're wondering why they're going there because this is where there is the best food or there is the best atmosphere. Um, so uh, Ethereum is, is, uh, is progressing very well. Uh, we, we will be uh, migrating to proof of stake uh, within Q1 next year. Um, and we've been also helping at consensus uh, and integrating within MetaMask many layer two solutions. So layer two solutions are essentially blockchains sitting on the top of the Ethereum as a, as a mother blockchain, which allow you to transact way faster uh, and at, uh, at uh, virtually no cost. So what is very important is not to look essentially at the, uh, the periodic uh, technical constraint you will have using sometimes uh, these new protocols, but thinking why the people are all going there and they, all the, most of the NFTs are happening today on Ethereum because there is this audience and because Ethereum offers you the reach. It's a little bit like if you decided to open your gallery in Central in Hong Kong, uh, there will be, uh, it will come with a, a higher rent. Uh, there will be uh, maybe uh, different things coming with owning a, a gallery in Central, but you could also get a gallery maybe in the suburb of Hong Kong where you will get less traffic and maybe it's going to be more convenient and it's going to be bigger and everything, but you will get you will not get the same reach uh, as, uh, as having a, a centralized uh, uh, position within, within a very large audience. So uh, all of these are, I think, are a very strong signal that there is something very big happening and we have to give some time for the, the technology to kind of accommodate uh, with, uh, with a very strong demand from, from the market. And one prediction I have is all these blockchains and we see that with, uh, with some other competitors of, uh, of Ethereum as well, 
face more or less the same problem. At some point, the demand just overcome as a capacity, uh, the, cap the capacity of the network. So the most important is to look as an artist or uh, as a collectioner, in which ecosystem do you want to sit and which ecosystem brings you uh, the, the audience, uh, brings you the reach uh, so that your, your arts or your, your gallery will get, uh, will get the most traffic. That's a great analogy, thank you. Um, Max, I'd like to go back to you and um, what you were talking earlier about the auction world's role in this. You've sold, I mean, for, for Sotheby's, um, uh, you've, you've, you've auctioned quite a few NFTs this past week in Hong Kong. Um, but I mean, the, 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 to most people, NFT is a way for um, artists, for creators to directly engage with um, an audience and, and to, to do away with the middleman. Um, so um, what, what, why, why, do, why do artists still need auction houses um, when they're selling NFTs? So it's a good question. Um, I think an auction, like at Sotheby's, when you walk into the doors, you know that, you know, we are offering kind of the best of the best. We've done our research, we've connected with the right people and we've brought the best offering um, that's out there to our, you know, through our doors. I think in a similar way, there's just so much um, creativity for, for better or for worse, that's coming out of, of a lot of these marketplaces that really just enable any and everyone to create. And there does need to be some sort of curatorial ship and some education aspect for the for the future market to continue growing. And I think that's really where Sotheby's can step in. In the traditional art world, that may be more of like a gallery uh, or a institution, museum. And I think that those will all grow out in its natural due course within like, I would say the NFT ecosystem or community. But until then, um, I still think that there's a, a, a need and a requirement for for a curation at the, at the highest level. And I think that's really why we've targeted very specific projects. I probably get five or 10 different pitches every day at this point about different projects. You know, can we do Sotheby's? Mm -hmm. Can we do Sotheby's? And is it partly you know, also because people are new to this, artists, creators are new to this. And, um, and, 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 and Sotheby's is, is offering to help them with the technology side of things, isn't it? So we are help, we are offering to help, um, but but a lot of it we're learning as we go as well. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. to accept cryptocurrency was a huge a huge step in the right direction for us, but it took some time. Um, we still don't hold custody of the NFTs, uh, be, you know, for for various reasons during auctions. So, you know, there's still a lot on the technical side that we can improve on. We are making significant strides internally to to achieve these goals and to be really kind of autonomous and independent in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also, you know, we recognize that, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a platform in which we can really grow the reach of the artist and really, you know, support them in, in their, and their artwork. And I think mm -hmm. we offer a very interesting, positioning within the whole marketplace since we do bridge the traditional physical art world and this new digital uh, you know, NFT marketplace in a quite unique way. And the responsibility isn't lightly, uh, but the, the ultimate goal is to really have, you know, a nice uh, cohesive, you know, uh, integration of the two so that traditional collectors are starting to look at NFTs and more native NFT collectors are starting to look at traditional. And we have seen a lot of crossover to date, but I would say the majority of the participation, the seven or eight auction, NFT auctions that we've hosted on Sotheby's have, have predominantly been new clients to Sotheby's, which has been really right, exciting. Interesting. I mean, the, 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 the decision to accept cryptocurrency, that must have involved quite a lot of inter internal discussion um just because you know you, you 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 as a as a major international auction house you know you have you have you have, have very rigid codes and 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 regulations in terms of knowing your customer so how how do you get around that problem um about the 
um, well, the 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 mon money laundering fears um, uh, that a lot of people have about dealing with businesses have a lot of, of these concerns about dealing with accepting cryptocurrencies. Right. Um, well, it's it's pretty straightforward. We've we we have to KYC every individual that submits a bid. Um, and we only accept cryptocurrency from five, you know, of the top exchanges, which we feel confident uh, in their processes mm -hmm. when they're onboarding clients. Right, so, right. Okay. you know, in that, in that sense, the risk is mitigated, but we definitely aren't capturing the full audience and the full potential, but we recognize our position needs to be held accountable. We need to be, we need to be governed by the same principles um, in our traditional line of work even in this new marketplace. And, and as such, we've definitely been met with some criticism, but ultimately I see in the future that there needs to be uh, a wider understanding of, of you know, KYC and, and, uh, and a little bit more integrity within the whole ecosystem for it to continue growing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, you touched on something that's, um, that, that I would love um, Frank and Ron to also address, and, and that is, you know, who are buying NFTs? Who, what, what is the community? Um, and um, uh, Ron, um, maybe you can give us a, 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 um, an idea of, of how things look where you are um, and, when, and when, when you started dealing in NFTs, how do, how do you find the artworks? Like how, how, you, you mentioned that you, you had very good advice, but, um, but, um, but, but in general, where, where do you look and, and how do you look? And who, you know, who do you discuss these things with? Um, well, I'm, I'm not a, a super active NFT buyer. I, I'm very particular about what I, I would buy. Um, I evaluate what it means to me, um, and uh, I, I really only um, buy what is uh, what I think is stable. Um, there's a lot of volatility in the market, and um, you know there's the, the primary market and the secondary market. So we see, you know, the secondary market is. I think measured in volatility and less volatility and growth um, means, you know, it's, it's more of a blue chip kind of direction the artist is going, um, you know, like the crypto punks. And, you know, I think it's all evolving from, you know, in the last uh, year, it's only kind of um, uh, grown its roots. So, uh, or, or, evolved into, you know, an international sensation. So uh, I think everyone's got their eyes on who the, the movers are. And uh, for me, I'm more, you know, fascinated by what it is, the mechanics of the industry. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm very, like, I, my whole collection of art is pretty much blue chip art. I buy, um, you know, I obviously have a lot in the Warhol side, uh, but also like Damien Hirst and Keith Haring and Lichtenstein and I've owned some Banksy's and, but I, um, I'm not uh, too risk adverse you know, when it comes to NFTs. I, I, I'm definitely engaged and, and um, looking more from the sidelines and learning as I go. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just find it, to be a very fascinating uh, subculture. Hmm. Frank, um, tell us yeah. more about who you meet, who you, or who who you who you find in Clubhouse, and and also yeah. that WhatsApp group that you were telling me about. Yeah, so so actually, for for my side, uh, actually, I spent literally hundreds and hundreds of hours, uh, you know, uh, listening, uh, listening on Clubhouse, but also engaging with artists. So um, this is a new space. This is a digital artist is, is a different artist than the traditional art artist, right? So, you know, in the end, what is a blue chip artist in the digital field? You know, well, the, the, the whole NFT art scene is just starting to, 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 to be alive and take off. So I spent a lot of time um, uh, on that. And even, even up to today, at least two, three hours a day, I speak to artists from all over the world. 
So this is really, in, in a way, I try to create my own collection. And I support also artists in that. Um, you know, you might have heard of uh, Misha Klein with his crypto pills. I've been helping him. I've been working with Obo on the Afro droids, have been helping him. Uh, and also, for instance, featured uh, artists on OpenSea, like Harry Packard. You know, I've been in touch with him for the last three months. And how beautiful he, you know, in the last five weeks, he took off and sold for 150 ETH, uh, you know, art uh, really taking off. So I'm really intrigued. I think there's an amazing quality out there of a complete new breed of artists. That's where my focus is. And um, I'm working here in Hong Kong with my uh, partner, Levina Lee uh, of Art Partners. And, um, you know, we hope to announce soon uh, an activity where we really highlight this new breed of amazing quality of artists that are entering the space. So actually that is my really interest uh, in what we are today. Uh, is there, I mean, is, is, is it still a very uh, male dominated space? Are most of the artists you deal with or you, you discover on um, uh, online, um, do, are, are they mostly still, still men? Are, are the no, women actually, no, becoming I, any more visible? No, I think at least, 25, if not 33% of my collection are made uh, by women. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I really don't see a difference on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I know that as a fact because of the five artists um, we are working with for our char upcoming charity auction, uh, four, four out of five artists are, are female and, and very tech savvy, um, but it is some... Um, uh, it is um, I mean, anything um, to do with crypto and blockchain, um, uh, gender, uh, the lack of diversity is, is still an issue, of course. But um, that's for another, that's a discussion for another day. Um, sure. um, let's look at some art now. Uh, Frank, you've prepared some slides um, that, um, um, that, that you want to show us. Um, Herman, do you mind sharing the, the screen? And um, that's it. Um, should we look at, yes. yeah. Oh, that's Elon Musk. Frank, yes. can you tell us about yeah, this particular I, I, NFT? Yes, I actually, I selected four pieces, just, um, you know, they all have a story. Uh, this piece I bought around this, if I'm not mistaken, it was the 17th of March. Uh, we, you know about the famous tweets between Elon Musk and, and Beeple. Uh, this is actually a 3D art piece, which, which is moving. Uh, it's done by an Italian artist, uh, Leo Vitti. Uh, he comes ex uh, Disney and Marvel. He worked on the major uh, cartoons with them. He is hugely, hugely skillful. I love his, his work. And uh, so this was the first piece. Also because I think uh, from an historic point of view, uh, this moment actually very much kicked off the, the interest in NFT. It was really around, uh, I think the tweets were, were done around 15th of March. Uh, so for me, this was is quite an uh, important piece. Next slide. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a skull. Uh, this is a skull made by Eddie Gangland. Um, you know, I was in touch, started to be in touch with Eddie uh, around end of March. Uh, Eddie um, launched these skulls. Um, and every day at 11 o'clock p.m. in Hong Kong time, uh, you know, he released five of these skulls. Um, I bought two of them and actually why I, I pictured them here, because for me, he was really one of the first one that put a kind of collectible in the market. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, I, I still have two of them, uh, which I will not let go because I think again, also in, in, in the history, maybe in the future, in the history about uh, the NFT art uh, uh, take off that is taking place now, uh, I feel Eddie Gangland was 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 very important, um, and I would say actually advise uh, you know the people to have a look to to this. They are still very affordable, but historically for me important. Interesting. When you look when you when you when you mis described um, these as collectibles, when you, when you when people sell NFTs in multiple collections, do you um, expect each? Um, so sort of each version to be different, so like CryptoPunks, or is there value as a collector 
um, in um, buying buying into an NFT that has multiple editions, but they're all the same. Um, I mean, that arrangement is of course beneficial to the artist, the creator, um, the creators themselves. Um, but does that hold any appeal to you as a collector? No, I, I, I come more from the artistic uh, side. So actually I'm not really buying much into co collectibles uh, hmm. unless there, it's real quality of work. Uh, so I, oh, I, I was also one of the lucky ones to get a Damien Hirst one. Um, yes, but, but in general, um, I'm, I'm more into the art side, the one-on-ones on the small series than, than on the larger collectibles, unless uh, it, it relates to quality of work. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. Yeah, this is, um, this, this is from an artist called Owo. He dropped the Afrodroids collectible. Um, yeah, actually, I gave, I've been in touch with him since April. I, I gave him the nickname, the people of Africa, uh, because you see the connection to people. Uh, he named it the, the Field State uh, show. He lives in Nigeria in a small village. Uh, part of the day he can't create because he doesn't have electricity, uh, showing the skulls of the sacrifices of his ancestors. In the middle, you see the crowd, the population, um, you know, um, of present life. And at the background, in, in, you see actually the continent of Africa overgrown actually by bushes and, and you know, in the scaffolds because Africa, he feels Africa as a continent uh, is, is still very much in building up phase with all its uh, difficulties. However, you see the blue sky uh, because he wanted to portray the optimis optimism from, from the African people and the belief in, in, in the future. So um, this was for me a very, very, it's a very dear piece to me because uh, also of the meaning and the quality of work. A very powerful piece indeed. Yes, thank um, you. Yeah, and, and this is the last, it's the mutant. What a contrast. Yeah, it's the, it's the mutant uh, Ape Yacht Club, which I just bought last week. And I just felt I needed one in my collection. Uh, I, I witnessed the whole board Ape uh, lounge in, in that famous weekend in, in April. And actually, when it all happened, I was a little bit upset about it because uh, for me, it's, it was a, I, I saw it as a derivative program. Um, I, I, therefore, I had difficulty calling it art because this was created by, by two, three different persons. So. Um, and, and also uh, at that time, um, you know, it, it took the whole space, um, um, you know, everyone spoke about the board ape and it was very much in the early development of art NFTs. And I, uh, you know, for, for weeks, it was, you know, it was a topic of, of, the, uh, of discussion at the same time of, of course, giving not space to really new digital artists that wanted to be heard. So for me, uh, it was, uh, you know, a controversial launch. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, I just didn't understand that collectibles are having an enormous important uh, role in the development of NFTs. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I could have bought tens of board apes, uh, let, it, let it pass by, but I really wanted to have now uh, one muted ape in, in, in my collection and I follow the whole ape, ape story and roadmap uh, with, with great interest. So that, that's why actually I insert it in, 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 in the view here. Mm. Can I ask how much do you pay for this? <laughs> I paid for this 4.5 Ethereum. Thank you, Frank. Then that's the last slide, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's the last slide. Okay. Uh, like should I we said, go to I, sorry? Should we go to Charles' uh, uh, um, uh, slides, and um, we also want to hear more about that project with Damien Hurst. Absolutely. So let me give you some background about these NFTs. Uh, I don't own myself these NFTs, but when uh, I got in touch with uh, uh, the co-organizer of the digital art fair, uh, Gillan. Uh, I said, okay, let me ping uh, within uh, the consensus uh, teams and, and try to get some pieces out of 
uh, different people within the consensus ecosystem. Uh, we are obviously a company focusing on blockchain, so there is a lot of people which have been involved with the space for a very long time. So what I did is I went on the, the company Slack and I said, I'm talking at the Digital Art Fair in Hong Kong in a few weeks. Uh, do some of you guys have some, some pieces and, and the story be, be, uh, behind this, this, uh, this, uh, this NFTs so we can share, uh, we, we can share them with, uh, with the audience. So I will not tell you who owns what, but uh, we start here with uh, this, uh, this first piece called uh, Crypto night um, which is essentially uh, kind of uh, highlighting uh, five crypto critics uh, and their advice on crypto so you can imagine that the, the owner of the nft is, is definitely bullish on crypto and uh, on ethereum in in general and, and was very sensible to this piece of art representing critics uh, of the space uh, so that's uh, that's the first interesting one on the next the next piece which came up uh, is the damien hurst um, uh, NFT event, uh, so which uh, which was done on one specific project which we we built over the past months is uh, at Consensus. So we built a dedicated uh, second layer blockchain. Uh, it's a proof of stake blockchain, so it's a, a carbon uh, a carbon free uh, type of blockchain. And this blockchain is dedicated to the, uh, the transactions and the minting of NFTs. So we really spend some time with our engineer to fine-tune a blockchain for, for, for that specific topic. Uh, the blockchain is called Palm. Uh, so you can know more about this blockchain and the auctions happening over there on palm.io. And this piece with Damien Earth was a, a, a very first interesting project. As I explained earlier, uh, the, all the owners of these NFTs can choose between uh, the original uh, Damien Earth physical piece of art or the NFT, but they will have to make a decision. And at some point, some people will decide to burn uh, the NFT, so make the NFT disappear and uh, totally from, from existence uh, and get the physical, uh, the physical uh, piece uh, from Damien Earth sent to them. Or some of some others will say, "I want to, I want to keep the NFT and please destroy the physical art." So uh, I find it very interesting to see um, how people can now start to to interact with their uh, with their their, uh, their their collection and and uh, and build uh, either uh, in the in digital or, or physical world. So there was about ten thousand uh, different NFTs uh, issued during this uh, this Diamond Earth uh, collection. The next. Uh, um, the sorry, next... can we pause there and sure. unpack that a little bit? Um, so why 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 did Damien Hurst give people the um, either or option? I guess it's to keep the scarcity. I don't want to put a word in the mouth of Damon Earth, but uh, I mean, if you buy a handy Warhol or if you buy a, a crypto punk, uh, you want to you want to make sure there is a, a certain level of scarcity uh, around it, and uh, and uh, and you want to own this piece. It means something for you, and you want to have a, a sense of. Uh, uh, non fungibility of this uh, of this piece of art. Um, so I guess it gives uh, the the artist gives you the choice here to relate to the to the piece of art in a physical way, maybe in your living room, uh, but also if you're more a digital person or if you think of arts maybe as a collateral and which you can bring into the world of decentralized finance, uh, then the, the the digital version and the NFT version of, of this piece will be will be much more valuable. So I guess it's just reinventing scarcity. Hmm. I, I would I would also add Charles um, it, it it targets a very important question like where does the value lie for a collector is it in the actual artwork itself like the physical representation that interaction or is it in the knowledge that you own this this nft digital asset um, which I think is a quite interesting one that that Damien really nailed with this uh, with this collection yeah, Absolutely. it is. A, a it is but it, but it, it is it is interesting that he has set up this kind of tension, and forcing people to change uh, to choose rather. So out of the ten thousand, do we know what 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 the ratio is in terms of mm, not yet? Okay. For, no, for the moment, the NFT exists only. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I actually uh, I actually got one of those uh, Damien Hirst NFTs, and. Um, I was like, well, for sure, I'm going to get the physical. I'm going to hang it on my wall. I'm going to enjoy it. I have, uh, I have, a, I own about thirty uh, Damien Hirst, and and I rotate them in my house. And uh, and I love the fact that it was an original, like it's a unique 
artwork, the you know unique artworks fetch more money and they're more collectible. Uh, also because of the scarcity, right? Um, and uh, and I kind of switched my opinion over the last like uh, uh, month, month and a half. I decided that I want to take it in you know the digital form and uh, add it to my wallet. Let's say I huh. figure all that out. <laughs> interesting. So it is an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting debate, and I, uh, I'll tell you just quickly. My my thought on the digital is, well, how do I display it? How do I enjoy it? And you know, if I'm not someone who's like staring at a screen, you know, for most of my conscious hours, you know, um, so you know, I bought one of those um, Samsung frames. So I have I have it. It's basically for my. Um, Andy Warhol self portrait that you have in the fair, and and the Damien Hurst and uh, and any future ones that I own. But but it was a, an interesting kind of uh, um, you know switch like uh, transition from do I want the physical like absolutely like I, I don't want the digital. That's my thought <laughs> when I first bought it. I was like I want to have it on my wall, uh, but now I, I you know I'm excited to have uh, the digital uh, NFT. Thank you for sharing. That's an amazing yeah. journey with uh, and and uh, kind of crafting a new relationship with some of your collections. Thank you for sharing. Well, yeah. we actually have a have an interview coming up with Damien Hurst. We must ask him that. <laughs> uh, oh, um, wow. So let's let's go on to the next slide, perhaps. Thank you. The next one is a very interesting one. Um, it's a project we we did with um, um, uh, with a, a startup called Euler Beats. Uh, it's built on a platform called Treom. Uh, we announced yesterday the acquisition of Treom, uh, which is essentially a software company dedicated to NFTs uh, by Consensus. So Treom is now part of, uh, of Consensus. And there was a lot of work uh, made over the years to prepare and launch early 2021. Uh, these new collections of, um, uh, of, of music and this new protocol for music producers uh, in order for them to uh, produce music, but also get uh, rewards whenever this music is being played or whenever the original uh, ownership of uh, a track, for example, is being exchanged. And it was really about reinventing uh, some kind of the, the business models and the, and the business automation um, uh, around, the, uh, around the music industry. So from a technical perspective, many uh, NFT you, you've seen uh, uh, previously on this, uh, on this screen or, or around the world are what we call the ERC721. Uh, so it's a type of format, let's say uh, it's, it's the format of tokens uh, uh, living on, on Ethereum. And this uh, specific NFT, which is uh, related to music, is another type of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of format. It's called ERC1155, and it brings much more capabilities of um, uh, and, and conversation with smart contracts. So this is with this type of NFT format, you can trigger royalties distribution, uh, you can tri trigger some kind of token economics. So it really creates uh, some kind of small ecosystem around this digital uh, art piece. In this case, it's it's purely music. So that's why we we, we selected this, uh, this NFT for for sharing with the audience today. Thank you. Um, with with music or, or artwork, um, uh, the there are questions about um, copyrights, of course, but the, the rights um, and where those rights um, reside. Um, one of our um, uh, listeners today, Alina, has just asked whether I think she's referring to our previous discussion about the Damien Hurst choice. No, um, she's saying maybe the reason why people are asked to choose either to keep the, uh, the, the physical or the NFT is that there's an absence of the clear distinction of rights. Um, at this stage, we are still not sure how to split the IP and ownership rights. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, Shall? So I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm obviously not a, not a lawyer. Um, I think it comes back to the scarcity, and if you have a, a mechanism which clearly uh, destroy or burn either the physical or, or the digital version of uh, of the art, the IP will stand. And, I, and probably we, with uh, during your interview with Damien Hurst in the in the coming weeks, you can you can touch on this point and and ask him where does he allocate 
uh, the IP on either physical or, or digital. But I think if if you create a mechanism which makes either one of each uh, existing, uh, it probably solve uh, solve the IP. Maybe to build on this IP thing. Uh, once wants to be aware that at some point maybe some of the regulators around the world and and there are many different regulators depending which country you sit will be thinking uh, of uh, of the status of these, some of these digital art if some of these digital arts start to distribute revenues uh, start to stream revenues or, or or start to be more involved in the financial transactions um, there will be there will be some some legal aspects to be uh, to be ironed out so it's still very early uh, mm -hmm. It's still a very much a flourishing industry, and a lot of innovation is uh, is is happening. But uh, we, we can probably expect at some point having regulators and lawyers looking at this and saying, if you do art this way, uh, maybe you you might need at some point uh, to uh, to get terms and conditions, to get possibly a license, uh, at least not being as uh, as free as uh, as the economy might be today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. We've only got a few minutes left, um, so I'd like to. I'm sorry, Sha, because I, I know I, I think you have more, sh more. You had prepared more shares to share, but I think we should address this um, very interesting question that has just come in from a listener, James Neary, who is a, a friend of yours, I think, Ron. Um, and um, so he wants to ask, uh, especially uh, addressing this question to Ron, with your knowledge and experience in blue chip art. Um, do you see more blue chip and diseased artists foundations moving into NFTs over the decade? And how do they do this authentically and does not come off as just financially motivated? Very interesting. Because we've seen you know, King of Carluna NFTs in, in the fair as well. Um, artists who are no longer with us, but their physical works have been turned into NFTs. Um, Ron, uh, would you like yeah. to answer this question? Yeah, so I'm I'm spending a lot of time actually um, looking at the uh, the copyright and um, IPs of you know these estates and living artists and and uh, how um, you know the the kind of concept of being able to represent something you own on the blockchain um, if you're the legal owner of it then you you know I think it's fair use to have it on the blockchain you know, to, to flex your collection, right? Uh, but uh, to James's question, um, I, I think a lot of the estates and uh, people who have um, living and dead artists and, and not even artists, I mean, there's like Louis Vuitton and, you know, all these big brands that are getting into the space now. Um, they're very protective of this new um, sector that they can capitalize on and I think they're being very protective of it and um, and I think a lot of them are conscious of how they're going to enter that world in a way that's not uh, perceived as purely like capitalist or capitalistic you know um, so I think you know the Andy Warhol Foundation you know the 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 um, NFT that I bought. It, it, it to me it was it was a very tasteful kind of um, I actually approached the Warhol estate about purchasing them <laughs> um, for the for with the intention of of uh, selling them as NFTs on my own. Uh, it ended up at Christie's and um, and you know rightfully so they have a bigger audience and everything. Uh, but um, I think you know they're being very careful about how they're going to enter that world. And I think others haven't even really figured it out yet because there's this whole NFT craze. And, and to me, it, it, you know, there is this element of, of um, you know, where the, the soul of the artist is at stake or of the brand is at stake in, in how they present themselves within the space. It has to be tasteful. It has to be with class and integrity or it's going to be perceived otherwise. And, uh, but I think we're going to see a, a, a huge explosion uh, from the you know, physical world entering the digital space, which is where all of my focus is and has been for mm. the last six months. Well, I suppose a lot of museums um, are doing it now out of need to raise funds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think they will. And I think it's a, a great kind of uh, opportunity for, for them to 
capitalize. And I think it's, you know, it's supply and demand and all of that. And, you know, if it's a, if it's, they're offering something that's of interest, then we're going to see in, in, uh, in, you know, what it sells for. And that's going to be a reflection of, um, of its true value, you know, mm. I'm afraid we've, um, so, um, uh, we're, we're, we're running out of time. I just want to read out um, a comment from Brett. Um, has Sotheby's thought about using VR and AR or AR to experience the, uh, I guess, to allow people to experience the digital art slash, slash NFT collectibles in their native form prior to actually auctioning it versus just printing it out or posting online? Uh, Max, would you like to answer that question? Yes, absolutely. Um, I every I think it, it's a very important question on how to exhibit your NFTs and how to, you know, properly display them at Sotheby's uh, in the lead up to the auction. Which is why we partnered with Digital Art Fair for the Rafik and it all kind of immersive room plus the seven other digital lots that were exhibited on Samsung the frame screens. Um, we're, we're constantly always trying to, to answer these questions with everything that we offer moving forward. I'm still hesitant about AR and VR um, personally. I just don't feel like it captures the medium in, uh, in the right way. But I think that with mm. several improvements, it will, it will become very commonplace for the, the choice uh, exhibition of these artworks. Interesting. And I need very, very quickly, the NFT I was presenting today are visible in the virtual world headquarters of consensus that we have on the central end. So when we go to the central end, to the consensus office in the virtual space, uh, there is coffee machines, there is all kind of meeting rooms, and there is uh, in this decentral end VR space, uh, NFTs from uh, some of the employees of consensus. So we, we are experimenting also in this space and, uh, and sharing uh, with our, our virtual colleagues uh, on, on the virtual world, uh, some of our NFTs. Excellent. I'm afraid we have run out of time. Thank you so much, um, our speakers today. I feel that we could easily have gone on for another hour. There's so much to talk about. Well, hope to see you all again soon. And um, thank you, Digital Art Fair. And um, I hope everybody um, got something out of it. Thank you. And um, thank you. Thank stay you. safe Thanks during the us. typhoon. <laughs> thank you. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.